Welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us today on the journey towards self mastery. Our next guest was born and raised and still resides in the Bronx. He has a bachelor's degree in international politics from NYU while minoring in Caribbean studies. He has a master's in history from Hunter College and a second master's in educational administration and supervision from City College of New York. You might know him from the Hidden Color series and several acclaimed documentaries, including 1804, The Hidden History of the Haitian Revolution, Elementary Genocide, Out of Darkness, Heavy is the Crown, and Dame Dash's The Secret to Bowling. He is a retired teacher, as well as a Pan-African-centered educator, consultant, administrator, staff developer, and curriculum writer for over 40 years. He has taught at every single level of education, K through 12, as well as college for over 12 years. His words of wisdom has been featured on the Wu-Tang Clan's album, The Saga Continues, with his own track titled, The Message. He is a master teacher and student and has a perfect SAT score to back it up. His mentor was the great Dr. John Henry Clark. He studied in Mexico with the great Dr. Ivan Van Sertema and studied in Egypt with the great Dr. Ben. He has been on all of the Hidden Color documentaries produced by Tariq Nasheed. He has helped develop the curriculum for five charter schools and has lectured all over the country. He currently has three books available on Amazon. As an elder, he still spends his time doing what he loves to do best, teaching, lecturing, and inspiring Black people to strive for greatness. Let's welcome today, Master Teacher, Kaba Haiwatha Kamene to the program. Hotep, Mr. G, thank you for this invitation. Been looking forward to this conversation for a while. Indeed, indeed, man. I've been looking forward more than, probably more than you have, man. Um, it, has, it has been an honor. I've been, uh, you know, kind of paying attention to your work for years and years. And I think we talked about this previously where, um, you know, looking at some of your work kind of helped me get out of the stump of, you know, when you first start teaching and you start to realize, you know, what, what is actually happening, you know, outside of the school setting and um, what the education system is like for Black boys and girls. And it almost made me run want to run away, man. <laughs> and then, um, you know, people like you, uh, Mr. Neely Fuller Jr., Dr. Welsing, um, kind of brought me back and let me, knew, let me know, like, the work that, that needed to be done. So I do appreciate that, man. Okay. No doubt, brother. It ain't over till we win. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, so yeah, man, uh, you, you've lived a rich, rich life, man. And I'm so excited to just dive into it and, um, you know, talk about some of your experiences. And I wanted to start with the meaning of your name. I know before you went by Booker T. Coleman, um, and then you changed it to Kaba Haiwatha Kamene. So what exactly does that name mean for you? And then why did you go about changing it? Well, my brother... Mr. G, I, I've always been proud of my name. I was, I'm junior, Booker Tellier Farrell Coleman Jr. My father was senior. My father is from Alabama. And uh, my father um, was named after Booker T. Washington. Mm. And I've always, you know, when I first met Professor Clark when I was 12 and a half and I was introduced to him, he said, oh, Booker T, you're going to be a great teacher one day. <laughs> and I said, yeah, okay. I, I mean, I wasn't going to dispute it, but that wasn't where I was thinking right then in my life. You know? right. So Booker T has always been uh, a name that I follow through. But the name Booker T. Coleman, you know, and my father had already transitioned, joined the ancestors when I corrected my name in 2002. But I, I just had to speak to him in my own way to explain to him, like, I, I just can't keep talking to our people about what has happened to us as a people and still carry the name of the enslaver. I, I was getting cognitive dissonance. I couldn't keep doing it because I, I was branded. And I said, no, I can't. So in 2002, I decided that I was going to correct my name because I, I don't call it changing. I call it correcting. Uh, okay. Uh, because on the form, at the time, it's very different now how you correct your name. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to the, uh, to the courthouse. And I got the papers, okay? At the time, there was no email like that anyway. There, there was no uh, thing that you do online like you do now. So you have to go get online, get your papers, fill them out. And one of the questions was, why are you 
changing your name. Of course, now I call it correcting, but they call it change, a, 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 a change of name. Right. And I said, because I would, I, you know, I have just reached a point in my life where I must reach back within my own cultural common sense and identify myself as to the culture from whence I came. Mm. And so that was my reason for doing mm-hmm. it now. The meaning of the name, very interesting, because ka ba, ka means in, in the comedic language, ka means spirit and ba means soul. Mm. Kaaba is the spirit of the soul. Hmm. Hiawatha was the name of a Native American brother who was known as the dreamer. And he unified the five nations of Northern American hemisphere. So it's not just part of the United States, but also part of Canada. The five nations he unified, the Mohawk, the Cayuga, the Seneca, the Oneida, and the Onondaga. He united them, brought them together as one people. Ka, spirit, Mene, is the first Nesetbiti, that's our African word for Pharaoh, was the first Pharaoh of the first dynasty of Kemet or Egypt, Kamene. So Kaba, spirit of the soul, Hiawatha of the dreamer, Kamene, who spiritually united upper and lower Kemet. That is powerful. So, yeah. But there's one more thing I need to add. Here's where I'm going to drop the other shoe. Right. Because like I said to you, because of my attraction to my original name, Booker mm-hmm. Tellier Farrell Coleman, Booker Tellier Farrell was Booker T. Washington's name. Tellier Farrell, the T stands for Tellier Farrell. But because of my attraction to the name, what I did is I took the name and I sort of kind of changed it up a little bit. So Buka became Kaba mm-hmm. and Coleman became Kamene. So, so I still have a flavor yeah. of my name. But I Africanized it. Got it. Got it. That makes a ton of sense, man. One um, more other thing I'd like to say, then I'm done with this particular concept. Mm-hmm. When I went to the shamans and to the priests and to the elders and to the priestesses to figure out how I would correct my name, what would I choose? This is what they said. In the African tradition, a name is not supposed to be a noun. It's supposed to be a verb. So every time somebody calls my name, they're not calling who I am. They're reminding me what my divine mission is on earth, which is my name means the uniter. So Mm. you see Pan-African, you see Nebu Africa, you can see how attracted I am to that concept, even in my name. Every time somebody calls my name, it's a verb. It's not a noun. My name doesn't tell you who I am. My -hmm. name tells you what I got to do. That is such a powerful concept. Um, It almost forces you to live up to that, you know, like it, it does particularly children. Mm -hmm. When children call your name, you know, they're telling you, hey, prepare us for the future. (laughs) Unite us, keep us together. Stop, you know, don't create those types of adversarial relationships in the classroom. You know, unite us, keep us together, Brother Kaba. Every time they call my name, that's what I think of, uniting people. Yeah. And even like when I read like different African books, like there's a lot of scenes where it's like, you know, remember your name, remember what you're here to do. Like when, you know, like when a character's struggling or whatever, like they always go back to their name and their purpose and what they're supposed to do. So it kind of reminded me of that, you know. Now now, now go back to my conversation with uh with the cheetah girl. <laughs> with Maya, what was one of the first questions I asked her is what would you be called as a superhero? What uh-huh. would your name be? You see, and she chose a name because that's a fast animal. And she wants to do things fast. <laughs> indeed. Yep. That is that is the little one. Indeed. Yeah, yep. man. Speaking of little ones, um, you know, diving into you uh, growing up in the city, 50s, 60s, there was so much happening, you know, as it relates to Black culture at that time. Um, I mean, you even had a run in with, with Malcolm X, man, like as, as a child, man. So uh, definitely want to hear about that. But um, what was your life like growing up? you know, in the Bronx, um, in that era, in that period uh, in time. And I heard, you know, around that time, you know, the Bronx was a completely different, you know, we think of the city kind of like as a little chaotic sometimes, but the Bronx was just different at that time. So um, what was your experience like, you know, growing up in the Bronx and some of your experiences, I guess that that has led you to, you know, where you are now? Absolutely. Well, my brother, just a a slight amend. I, I moved to the Bronx in 1987. Oh, okay, okay, okay. But, uh, October of 87. 
Mm-hmm. But I I grew up and lived in Manhattan. Mm. Okay. I grew up in the Amsterdam project from 61st to 64th Street on Amsterdam Avenue. For those that are watching, this may not mean much to you, but just know this. Just to our south, which we called our, our back door, was Hell's Kitchen. Hell's Kitchen was like from 59th Street and 10th Avenue straight on down. Amsterdam and 10th Avenue is the same avenue, except when you get to 60th Street, it changes from a name to a number. So that when you get down into the 50s, you know, that's Hell's Kitchen. And then our front yard was Harlem. Mm. So we were right in the middle. You know where Lincoln Center is in New York City? That's where the Amsterdam Project is. Mm. And that's where I grew up. You know, my growth, and I know that many people sometimes focus on some of the challenges and the negativity in projects, which we had. We had our challenges. Mm-hmm. But we also had some wonderful times, too. Right. And we had some hard working families, too. Brothers and sisters just out of World War II. My father was an example. My father was in World War II. He moved to um, uh, the Amsterdam Projects with my mother. He met my mother and met her in Boston. And in 1945, they got married and they came back and they lived in the city, 145th Street in Harlem. Mm-hmm. And then they moved to the Amsterdam Project. And so my, my evolution in the project, you know, I, you know, I have history. I have a story, just like every other brother brought up in the projects. Right. You know, we all got history, but what I try to focus on is the good things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I know I watched them bring drugs into the projects. Mm. I remember the car that used to come up on Amsterdam Avenue and the people would congregate around it to get the drugs, to come back into the community, to sell it in the projects. In fact, the Amsterdam projects was one of the cornerstones to where people used to come to get drugs from a lot of different places, including Long Island. So I saw that and I understand that. But I also understand the good people that work very hard, that continue even in our neighborhoods today, be it the south side of Chicago, Detroit, Bronx, Harlem, you know, south central uh, L.A. There's hardworking people. And I think sometimes we always focus on the negativity and not the positivity. Mm -hmm. I've known very good people Mm -hmm, from all mm -hmm. different cultural backgrounds, African based, but all different backgrounds. These were some wonderful people. We looked out for each other. You know, I, you know, I remember uh, growing up, we had families that were from Puerto Rico. Mm-hmm. We had families that were from Haiti. And I remember that on Sundays, every other, not every Sunday, but many Sundays, we, my mother would cook uh, fried chicken and um, uh, kidney beans and rice. Puerto Rican neighbors would cook arroz con pollo y habituela, you know, <laughs> chicken, rice, and peas. And our community from IT would cook, cook poo, you know, chicken with rice and beans. And, and we'd all have the d- d- different plates that we go to different homes to bring different versions. Uh-huh. And so there were Sundays that we had my mother's uh, uh, chicken and, and, and kidney beans and rice. And we had our neighbors, our ro con pollo, and we had our, 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 our community from IT and we had their poo and their rice and their peas. And we didn't talk about whose was better. We just talked about how it all was so good. (laughs) And that's how I grew up. And that's what is, that's what fuels me in Pan-Africanism because it's not, it's not what they make us to be, you know, it's all that. And you know something in so many different ways, every one of those dishes were very similar. You're right. You are right. It was only the flavor. It was only the herbs and the spices that changed. You're right. You're right. You no, know, I mean, the, you know, you might have adobo with the arroz con pollo. You know, you could have pig feet uh, with the uh, kidney beans and rice. You might have something else as it relates to the community from Haiti that flavored their food. But yeah, they, we use the green, the green seasoning. They they use okay. the green. Puerto Ricans use green seasoning as well. I, I Absolutely. Believe. And so. Jamaicans, too. It's mm-hmm. all the same. It's all the same. Our collard greens is Jamaicans kalalu. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. all the same man you're right you're right absolutely and so you know that's how i grew up i i grew up in that type of environment where uh senora diaz if she saw me doing something wrong she could correct me just like my mother could that is interesting you know what i find interesting too like i know you mentioned before um in previous interviews that you learned your african history and about african people from the, your puerto rican neighbors which that's was it. interesting it, 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 it most definitely was because, brother, I grew up Roman Catholic. 
mm-hmm. choir boy, altar boy, wanted to be a priest, believe it or not. Wow. Yeah, want to be a priest, man. Because when you grow up in that environment, from kindergarten straight on up, man, I was in Catholic school. You, you, you have a reverence. See, this is how sometimes forces get your mind. Because mm-hmm. from a child, but there was just something wrong. And I had neighbors that practiced, my friend, his family practiced uh, Santeria mm. and Espiritismo, which has the flavor of the Taino. Mm-hmm. And I remember going to their homes. They, they always didn't have the altar up all the time because they didn't know who was coming into their house. And it wasn't, and to, to a certain extent, even to this day, it, it's not really looked upon as positive. Yeah, it's not. It, it's funny from a lot of the cultures. I mean, even from Haitian culture, um, you know, voodoo, voodoo, voodoo is not looked at as a positive thing, you know, like yeah. <laughs> it's the same, very similar. Absolutely. And well, it's the same Orishas, even Candomblé from Brazil, even Obia in the English speaking Caribbean, even the African American Baptist Church mm. has the same flavor. Mm. It may come across differently. It's called syncretism. Syncretism is when you take one thing, but you superimpose something else over it. So what they did is, is African people in the Caribbean and in this part of the world, what they did was that, that Catholicism was at the heart, but but they superimposed the African spiritual system of the Orishas, of Yoruba, mm. over that. Mm. And they had Las Sietas Potencias, the seven powers, Jemaja, Obatala, Chango. And you have to imagine that an eight, nine-year-old, that's about where I was, 10, 11, visiting my friend's home. And all of a sudden now, his house didn't look like it looked before. <laughs> but now they had the altar up. They had uh-huh. the statues up. All right. And they was ready to get down into some serious prayer and invocation. And brother, I was just all up in it, man. That touched my African spirit, brother. Mm, so you weren't scared. You were just, you were oh, fascinated no. by this. And they loved me. The adults loved me. They say, Mira, skip. <laughs> look, look, skip. <laughs> <laughs> because I was, I, man, when they was drumming, I was dancing. I was getting up, you know, because when you're young, you don't have those inhibitions, mm. you know, and, and when the spirit touch you, brother, you just got to get up, you know, and get involved like James Brown said. Indeed. And I was just getting up and they just loved me. And, you know, I, I, I never ate the same chicken I watched running around the house, mm. you know, and, and I watched it and I said, this is really something else. So the point that I'm making and the point that I've made in the past is I was introduced to, when I was introduced to Africa, the first introduction was not through history. That would come later. Mm -hmm. My first introduction to Africa was through spirituality. Mm. And that ignited me from a very young age. It, 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 It touched my soul, man. And it just, when I saw it, and this is why, as I've grown and I've heard people say negative things about Santeria, I know they don't know what they're talking about. When I hear mm-hmm. people say negative things about Vudan, I know they don't know what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're just trying to bad mouth the spiritual system because they fear its power, but they know it's African. Mm. Yeah, that, See, that is. So I invoke the Orishas every day of my life, unashamedly, unapologetically. And if people can't handle it, that's personal. Indeed, indeed. And I think um, I think it's uh, definitely uh, um, a European thing that that has been like centered into us to fear, like the most powerful tool that we we've had historically, the spirituality component. Um, now it's like we're running away from it, and I think that that is a you know Eurocentric thing that we've been taught to. But but if we really dive into it and look at it. There are, you know, Europeans, white people in Haiti, in Puerto Rico, in these different countries that are learning the spirituality. So, <laughs> you know. Oh, yeah. And, and, and you know, it, it's, it's just so interesting because you can connect the Orishas to, to, to Kemet. Mm. You know, there's a book written by a brother, Dr. J. Lucas Olumidi, O-L-U-M-I-D-E. He wrote a book titled The Religions of the Yoruba. Mm-hmm. where he connects the Yoruba tradition with the Kemetic uh, spiritual system. 
where he shows the same Neteru that existed in Kemet, Kush, also exists amongst the Yoruba. Mm. There's a connection. Dr. Mm. Uh, Sheikh Ante Diop, the great Senegalese scholar, says that there is a cultural unity in Black Africa. I believe it. Definitely you know, believe between it. the Baptist Church here in the United States, to Santeria, uh, to Vudan, to Candomblé, to Obia, to all of them. There's a connection. There's a very deep connection. And that's mm-hmm. what I try to talk about in my book, Spirituality Before Religions. Yes, indeed. And like you said, man, it's the same food, but different spices, right? That's it, brother. Different <laughs> flavor, but same thing. I remember one time I was listening uh, to to music and I said, wow, that sounds like, um, uh, like a, you know, like the pachanga and the charanga of, of, of uh, Republica Dominicana, like the Dominican Republic. Mm-hmm. It, it, you know, it sounded like the music of the Dominican Republic. It was Haitian. It was mm. from IT. Same sound, same music. And then I heard High Life that comes from Ghana. All three music sound alike. Yeah. There's a connection, brother. There's ties that bind us together. And the more we fight the ties, the deeper in trouble we get. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. the less we fight it, the better we get. And once you know better, you're going to do better. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, man. Speaking of that, man. Um, so growing up too, man, you had a little run in with Malcolm X um, as, a, as a kid. Uh, so can you talk to us about that? And then like maybe people in the community, um, I know we'll get into Dr. John Henry Clark that had, you know, influence on you, um, you know, at the time as you're growing and developing into a man. Yeah. Well, you know, also mind, mind you that this is around the same time that I'm going to my friend's house with Santeria. You know, I'm seven years old. Mm hmm. And my mother used to always get her hair done at a place in Harlem on a, between 120th and 121st and 7th Avenue. It's now Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard. Mm-hmm. And um, I, it, uh, every other Saturday, my mother used to go up to get her hair done by Mrs. Jefferson, who was her beautician. And I, being seven, would go with her. And Mrs. Jefferson had the front stall, which meant that I used to sit like on the porch by the window looking out onto Harlem. A couple doors down, there was a, a, a luncheonette owned by an African-American elder brother. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I used to always eat lunch there. And one time I came out, th- this was in the spring, which I think would have been 1961, if my math is right. I saw a crowd at the end of 121st Street, give or take. And I went back and I asked my mother, you know, could I go down and check out what was going on? She said, yeah. And so I went and I worked my way through the group and I was staring at the man that was talking, this man was just tall. I, you know, he was very tall and you know, I'm seven years old. So I'm, and I'm standing in front of him, you know, and I'm just looking up at him, man. And something took me by surprise. I'd never seen before was I, I tried to figure out where his forehead ended and his hair began <laughs> the hairline. Cause I had never seen a man whose complexion and hair was the same color. I'm a child. Uh-huh. I don't know who this is. All I know is I'm trying to figure out where his forehead ended and his hair began. <laughs> and so I don't know how long he spoke. But then eventually, the you know, it ended and the crowd went their way and he went his way. And I went back to Lorisa's beauty shop and sat down. And then, a, and then a brother that used to work in the beauty parlor, you know, helping the sisters out in various things, came and said, man, you ain't going to believe who was just talking to us. And Mrs. Jefferson said, well, who was it? He said, well, you ain't going to believe it. And the other beautician said, well, who was it? And he said, you ain't. They say, listen, who was it? <laughs> he said it was Malcolm X. Now, this is the first time I know who this is. Up until now, I, I was still thinking about where his forehead ended and his hair began. But <laughs> the thought of this man and what happened really wasn't in the foremost of my mind. It's not until he came in that he I didn't even know he was in the crowd. Right. And they said, Malcolm was not there talking to y'all. He said, yes, Malcolm X was just here, right down the block, talking to us. And he said, ask that young brother right there. He'll tell you everything Malcolm said, because he was looking up in Malcolm's face, and he was just staring at, I know he can tell you what Malcolm said. Now, (laughs) I couldn't tell you the first thing Malcolm said, because I wasn't listening to him. I was too busy trying to figure out where his forehead ended and his hair began. (laughs) That's the seven-year-old mindset. (laughs) And that's it. Okay, and that's the story that I tell pretty much where Maya is right now, pretty much that type of mindset, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. intelligent, perceptive, 
I could pick up things, but there were certain things I just didn't know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But when he came in and said that, that's when I know who that was. And I tell this story, and I know you can enjoy it, because being around children, particularly young children, they could be all engrossed in what you're saying. They could be all up in your face, but not listening to a word you say. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> Definitely have been there. Okay. And also, along with that, with that concept of not listening to a word you're saying, you never pick up why they're really looking at you unless you ask them. Say, what are you thinking right now? You're looking all up in my face. I, I have monkeys on my face and they laugh. <laughs> okay? I say, why are you looking all up in my face like that? What are you thinking right now? And you'd be, well, I'm sure you've done it. You're surprised at what the children will tell you. Yep. Because <laughs> it's nowhere near what you were hoping they'd listen or what they were. For sure. As an educator, sometimes like you're you're given this lesson and you feel like, man, I'm I'm like doing my thing, like it's great, and this and that and the third, and you look up and it's like <laughs> hey man, uh, you know, and I'll tell you a story about our older daughter. She was like in the maybe in the third grade, and she was doing a long division. Mm -hmm. Right. And and I was she, you know, she said, Daddy, I don't you know, I'm not really understanding this. And so I took her through the whole process and taught her about long division and about how to do it and structured it. And she was getting it. She finished it. She wrote up the answers, took a little while, mm -hmm. but she was getting it. Next day she comes home and I said, uh, how you doing with the, uh, with the fractions? She said, oh, check this out. And then she started showing me, she was whizzing through them quick. <laughs> and man, I was so proud. I said, wow, you know, a dad daughter moment where I, I taught you something. Yeah, I'm proud. She said, Well, Daddy, you know, you did help me, but we had a substitute teacher today. And she told me, When you're doing long division, just remember Dracula's mother sucks blood. Uh huh. Okay. You divide, multiply, subtract. Okay. And then bring down. Power of the acronym. And I thought I was doing something with my daughter. <laughs> But these are the little things I've learned in education that if you drop acronyms or if you drop shortcuts, like my very educated mother, comma, just served us nine pickles. That's the that's the nine planets, although there's only eight. But that's a side story. So you have, um, you know, the idea of 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 that. And then you have PEMDAS when you're dealing with order of operations, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. parentheses, exponents, you know, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. Acronyms work. Mnemonics work. But mnemonics connect the neurons of the brain. And so once you get language in place, there's a lot that you can do with this. And this is what I've worked with as I work with children mm -hmm. is, to, is to understand how children think. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times as adults, man, we try to get children to think like adults. What I believe is adults should think like children in order to bring children halfway to the point where adults want them to be. Never lose your childhood. Never lose what it is to be a child, you know, don't get old because I've met 18 year olds that are old and I've met 80 year olds that are young and spry because <laughs> it's all in the spirit. You're it's right. all in the engagement, the excitement of life. That's what children, I have never met a kindergarten child. There was sometimes I wish the kindergarten child hadn't come to school because sneezing and coughing over everybody. But when you in kindergarten, you don't want to miss school. You're excited if, if, if it's a great classroom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, you want to go to school, you go sick. But by the third grade, I saw that student making excuses as to why they didn't want to come to school because we turned them off. And when I say we, I speak collectively because I don't point fingers. The mm. school turned them off. That's why I liked it when I, I, I did the, the um, upward expansion, where as a kindergarten teacher, I became their first grade teacher, then their second grade teacher. Did you do that all the way up? I did it all up to fourth grade. In ah. school that I was in, up to fourth grade. That is that is that is powerful, man. Just thinking about that. Yeah, I was their teacher all four years. And had I been in a school that connected it to middle school, I might have gone on. Now there's an argument against that because they don't get uh, diversity. I really yeah. don't care. I'm there to teach them. Exactly. Exactly, man. And I, so I, I knew my children. My children knew me. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And I get messages from them even to this day, man. Some of them are close to 50 years old, grandparents, parents, established. And they, and they say, weren't you the brother that 
weren't well, weren't you the teacher that taught me Kiswahili in kindergarten? <laughs> <laughs> And but that's that relationship that I created with them, you know, and that's what it's all about, you know, the relationships, uh, you know, and that's how I think most like, you know, like as a as a kid, usually when you get into an adulthood, you don't really remember like um, like this exact lesson, but you remember the relationship you had with, you know, some of your teachers that you really learned a lot from or enjoyed, you know, and that's where I think it starts. And we miss that point sometimes. Yes, we do, brother. Yes, we do. And as teachers, there's two parts of the brain that you need to know, the amygdala and the hippocampus. Mm. The amygdala amygdala is an almond shape located in your limbic system in the brain, and that's the house of emotion, particularly fear. Most Mm -hmm. of us teach to fear. Mm. The test-taking skills is all about fear. Mm. You know, there are even adults, they get upset stomachs, they start to sweat. Yep, yep. They get a cold sweat. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the reason why they feel that way is the same reason why the children feel that way in testing. Um, And that basically is because they've been taught the information to the amygdala. Mm. The, the, The part of the brain you want to teach to is the hippocampus, also located in the limbic system of the brain. In the lateral ventricles, the lower part of the lateral ventricles is your hippocampus. It, it looks like a seahorse. Mm-hmm. And that's the area of what you just said before is the cornerstone to it. I, I, when I'm demonstrating what I'm talking about, I always ask the people in the room, can you remember that one teacher that you just absolutely love? Most people can come up with a name immediately. Oh, Miss Williams in second grade. Mm-hmm. Oh, Mr. Johnson, he was my coach. They can come up with a name almost immediately. Mine is John Henry Clark, mm, yeah, we, but you can almost come up yeah. immediately. Mm-hmm. And that is that, that person taught to your hippocampus, which is your long-term memory. Mm. Yeah. I know you mentioned too, like, uh, you know, that black educators, all educators really should study the brain because, you know, we're educated. <laughs> Obviously there should be a huge connection. And, um, you know, there was a book I was reading and it was talking about the, uh, like how, you know, how to learn and things like that diving into like the emotional component, you know, is a huge factor in like learning, you know, because for us, like the minute you don't care about something, it's like, you just stop listening. Like I don't really care about, you know, you know, when kids say like, what does this have to do with anything that I'm doing right now? Or what does this math have to do with my life? Like, you know, and once they don't care, it's like they shut off completely, you know, but once you dive into their life and you're like, wait a minute, you don't remember that basketball game you watched last night and you, you know, you, you put in those numbers and you make them like, you know, think about it and you dive into the emotional component. That's when I think that the true learning actually begins, like you were just saying. So that um, I think is very powerful, like diving into learning on an emotional level and not just like, you know, intellectual, uh, but diving into, you know, your, your, uh, your favorite educator, Dr. John Henry Clark. Um, you know, he's, the reason that, you know, you exist as an educator yourself. So what was it that he poured into you as a young man that really made you want to go and, you know, do exactly what he said you was going to do, become a great, a great teacher. (laughs) And, you you know, know, it's interesting um, because I often tell people that if Dr. John Henry Clark had been a a basket weaver, I'd be doing classes on weaving baskets. (laughs) And, and it goes back to what I told you about when you teach to the hippocampus and the long-term memory. Right. The one thing I remember about Professor Clark, no matter what the subject was, I talked to him about uh, eating. You know, we talked about eating. We talked about dating. We talked about marriage. Not just history, mm. you know. And that's why I wrote my first book on William Leo Hansberry, because I interviewed Dr. Chancellor Williams, the author of Destruction of Black Civilization, who was a student of William Leo Hansberry. Mm. And one of the things that Dr. Williams told me about Professor Hansberry is pretty much the way I feel towards Dr. Clark. And it is what I strive to have people feel towards, to me, I try to replicate. And Mm -hmm. that is, no matter who your favorite teacher was, I can guarantee you one thing. You felt safe when you were with them. Mm -hmm. You felt safe. Mm -hmm. You felt that they had your best interest at heart. They would never lead you astray. 
There was no trying to get over on you. And they cared about, honestly cared about you. What Chancellor Williams told me about William Leo Hansberry, he said, and these are his words, he was vitally interested in you, not just as a student, but as a, a person. And that is how Dr. Clark and I related. That's how I feel the relationship with Dr. Clark. Went. He was interested in me, not just in school, not just in education. He was interested in me as a person. Who am I? What am I? You know, how am I developing myself? Right. And with that came the history and the culture. See, that's where the history came in. Remember, the before was spirituality. Mm -hmm. Now, here comes the history. Now, let me tell you, it was easy for me to deal with the history once I got the spirit. It might not be that easy the other way around. If you get the history first and then the spirituality, it's not that it's going to be difficult. But I tell you, once I got the, the African spirit, African history was just the next natural step. That makes sense. Definitely makes you know? sense. And then when I began to find certain things out, whoo, wow. When I began to realize the truth, Mr. G, the truth, mm -hmm. there was just no stopping. Mm. You know, and Dr. Clark used to always say, perfect your craft. Mm. Never believe you've gotten to a point where there's nothing else to do. You can always get better. As long as you breathe, you can get better. Perfect your craft. Powerful words right there. Powerful words. Um, so on the pursuit of perfecting your craft, like, you know, going into the college level, what did you have in mind um, going into college? And then what was your experience like in college? Like, I know between the time that you're going into college was like the initial time of the first kind of black studies departments, you know, in, you know, the country pretty much being formulated and um, this becoming a popular subject matter at that point. So what was your experience like, you know, going into college, uh, learning about, you know, Caribbean history and Black history, Black culture, um, international studies and things of that sort? Well, it, it's, it's interesting because the early part of my education, you know, I, you know, I, when I graduated from, uh, from high school in 1971, I went to Borough Manhattan Community College mm -hmm. here in New York. I went for a year, but I want to become an astronaut. So I applied to the uh, United States Air Force Academy. Of course, they did things. It's all part of the game. Uh, but eventually, uh, they denied me admission into the Air Force Academy itself, but they offered me a spot in the preparatory school, which is on the same campus. But because things happened so late, they had filled up all their uh, numbers, and but they did have a place in the preparatory school, mm -hmm. which would say that I could go to the preparatory school, and then the next year, I could go to the Air Force Academy. So I took that. I went to the Air Force Academy. And then they messed around, did a lot of things. I wanted to be an astronaut. They did a lot of things to stop me. So I decided to transfer to West Point, the United States Military Academy at West Point. Mm. So I transferred there, spent some time. I became the, the, the black brigade commander for the black freshmen. Mm -hmm. Because... Them folk crazy out there. <laughs> and when I look at the military and I understand what happens in the military and I understand that when you go to the academies, these folk are coming at you with everything because they are scared of, they're already scared of you in general. But when you reach that level to go to the cadet, to go to the war college, they sort of kind of look at you just a little bit differently. I had some wonderful experiences there. Right. But I also had some horrendous ones. And that's why I said, hey, to the other black cadets, hey, we got to get ourselves together. Because <laughs> this ain't going. So again, going back to United, uniting us, I united all of the. There were seventy-seven of us, the largest black contingent of cadets in the history of West Point. Really, it was my year. I was in the class of nineteen seventy-seven. But you see, when I left in October of seventy-five and went to New York University, I could not transfer some of my credits which meant that I had been a freshman in college three times, three years I was freshman. Borough Manhattan, Air Force Academy, West Point, three times. <laughs> uh -huh. I was never a sophomore. I was half a term junior and half a term senior. Had I taken another eight classes in mathematics, I could have doubled major in math hmm. because of all the math I took in the previous schools I went to. I, I, I had like 20 something credits in math. 
I had 14 alone in my first year at West Point. Mm -hmm. And so when I got to NYU, I began to realize that um, I joined, you know, the, you know, the African American Association at NYU, but my relationship really was at Hunter College with Dr. Clark. Because that, mm -hmm. that's where he was. He was the chairperson for the Black and Puerto Rican uh, um, uh, culture department. Right. And so NYU, I did not have that much of a connection with as a campus, although I did a lot of different things. You know, as students, we hang out, do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But my relationship in college really was with Dr. John Henry Clark at um, Hunter College. Right. In Midtown Manhattan on the east side. Mm hmm and so really um, my, my minor in Caribbean studies and, and also South American studies, but, I, but I, I had a direct focus on revolution because mm. at the time there was a lot of revolutions happening in Central America, South America, in the Caribbean, there was a lot of uprising. Mm -hmm. And by this time, the Jamaica was newly so-called independent and all of the islands were newly independent. The African nations in the 50s and 60s were newly in, uh, independent. And so I found it appropriate to sort of kind of study the revolutions, what started them, what sustained them, what destroyed them. Looking at Che Guevara, looking at Fidel Castro, you know, looking at, um, at uh, Patrice Lumumba of the Congo. Hmm. L looking at Samori Michelle of Southern Africa. I just wanted to look at this revolution. What, what was it? I had just come out the military, understood all about war. Now I wanted to understand revolution. And so that's how I, I angled into that. But then again, my relationship was with Dr. Clark at Hunter College because that's where he was. Mm. And I often look back and wonder why I didn't go to Hunter for my undergrad. It would have been cheaper for one thing. <laughs> Because it cost the same NYU. for NYU as it did for Columbia University. It was $99 a credit. That's a lot of money back then. Had I yeah. gone to City College, it would have been much less than that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But for whatever reason, I did what I did and I made my choices. The VA benefits paid for them anyway. And money I made while I was in the military also subsidized my college loans. So it wasn't about the money that was the problem. It's how much I could have saved. And I just... <laughs> Going to City College and or, or or to to a city university instead of going to NYU. So you know you graduate from uh, your programs and before you you I guess officially were like that like before you officially committed to teaching you were a disc jockey, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know I was an intern at WWRF, uh -huh. and I also worked with Inner City Broadcasting. You know that was WBLS, the big music station and i received notice you know because we were looking for a job right you know i was looking for a job i should say and when you in radio if you the first job you get is the most important mm -hmm. once you get your first job you're in it's just a matter of you moving around the system and in gary in gary indiana they had a spot not just for a weekend disc jockey but they needed a, a production manager right and so in me, they found both because I was producing things as an intern at WWRL. So I went out to Gary, left New York, went out to Gary. And I took the job, all black radio, uh, all black radio station, the black bank, Seaway Bank from Chicago bought WLTH. Mm. So I became the production manager and um, the weekend disc job all day, all day. I was just there the whole day. I opened up the, the radio show and I ended it. You know, you know, like from six to six. That is interesting. And Gary, Indiana, home of the Jackson Five, right? Home of the Jackson Five. And now here's the key, because the uh, teacher that taught radio and television at Roosevelt High School, all black high school, mm -hmm. went on sabbatical, went on leave for a year. And so they uh, were looking for someone because it was a very popular program. And they didn't want to discontinue it while he was on sabbatical. so. They were looking around and um, a friend came home and said, um, would you be interested in teaching at Roosevelt High School, teaching radio and television? And I said, sure. And 
See, the difference between myself and the teacher was that he was not a disc jockey. He just taught radio and television. Uh I was a disc jockey in town. And that drew attention to this program at Roosevelt High School. And so I said, sure. So I started teaching. And the first day that we're in school, August 1977, it's time to go to lunch. I go downstairs and I get online. The teachers and the students are online. One, one of the teachers sees me and beckons me to come to the front of the line mm-hmm. because she said, you know, we don't have to wait online. We just come to the front and get our food. But I also saw in the students, you know, like you're skipping me, <laughs> you know, uh-huh. uh, you know, they went along with it. They understood it. They didn't have a problem. Well, they had a problem, but they didn't say anything. They just saw it and they just went. And I noticed, I felt it. I go into the teacher's faculty lounge and uh, first day of school, everybody's griping, complaining. Oh, man. And like I'm saying to myself, like, I really don't want to have to listen to this. Mm, the teacher's well, the lounge. Day, the teacher's <laughs> like, oh, well, that's a, could be very toxic. Sometimes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So the next day, second day, I come and I get online again. And they beckon me to come to the front. I say, no, that's the right. I, I, I make believe I'm having a, con- well, I am having a conversation with a student. But I'm making like I'm having a conversation, so I'll I'll wait a while. So I start talking to the students, and we keep talking, talking. And then student in front turns around, says, hey, aren't you teaching radio, television? Yeah, I'm teaching radio. Where are you? They're telling me their names and going back and forth. So then we get to our place where we're going to get our lunch. And I get my tray. They get their tray. And the student look at me and say, wait, where are you going to eat? I say, well, where are you going to eat? He said, well, we're going to sit over here. I say, can I sit with y'all? And they looked at me. <laughs> he said, yeah, come on over. This is high school, right? This is high school, yeah. Okay. This is high school. And um, I sat down, started talking to him, you know, tell him about me, where I'm coming from, WLTH. They all knew that WLTH was the newly acquired black radio station in town. Right. And so we're talking and things like that. And um Third day, I do the same thing, sitting with the students. Fourth day. And then one of the days, I'm not sure when it was, Mr. G, I happened to ask, what do you know about Africa? And I started talking to them about Africa, about the legacy. I talked to them about Malcolm X and things like that. You know, mm-hmm. and I asked them questions about the Jackson 5. Many of them knew the Jackson 5. Really? Many of them were friends. Remember, this is 1977. Uh-huh. This is not long after the Jackson 5 become popular in the late 60s. Hmm. So for the older brothers like Jermaine and Jackie and them and the daughters, Rebe, all of them were, went to Roosevelt High School. Many of them went to Roosevelt High School. That is interesting. And so they knew them. They knew the, the Jackson family. Their families knew the Jackson family. Hmm. And so, you know, I would ask them questions, get them involved. They would come wonderful. And um, they and then we started talking about Africa. Mr. G, eventually. The students would literally, move, you, you know, the kind of cafeteria desk where you, where it comes up and like you pull it down mm-hmm. and you have all the benches and then you have the table. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, that's what they had there. They rearranged those tables around me so I could talk to them during lunch. That's powerful. That's, what, what were what were the uh, the adults like? What, what were they? What were they like thinking about all this stuff? I was building a contingent of enemies. Wow. Because there was a problem. You know what I used to do on uh, Saturdays and Sundays, mainly on Sunday, I arranged with my, I taught two radio classes and I taught one television class. Right. Within the first month, the students came to me and said, you know, nobody else wants to do this. They've never done it. But, you know, we like to roller skate. You know, can can you become the faculty um, person for our roller skating team? And I said, sure. It was on Friday. Uh, they rented a bus. I even got some money for them to be able to get hot dogs and chips and something to drink while they were there. Mm-hmm. But I said to myself, none of these adults want to be with these students. Hmm. And then they want to know why the students don't like them. <laughs> I don't like them, and I'm not even one of them. <laughs> there it is right there. And then the junior class. This is when you had a junior prom. And then the junior uh, representatives of the junior prom class 
came to me and said, you know, would you be our faculty advisor for the junior prom? Mm -hmm. And I said, sure. You know, I'm, you know, I'm 23 going on 24 that November. And I'm saying, sure. And in my mind, I'm saying there's something wrong in this school. <laughs> when the adults don't want to participate in the life of the children, mm. want to know why they don't feel close to you. Well, you're not close to them. Exactly. And so what I did was I arranged to periodically, frequently anyway, to raise money for the junior prom. What I did was I had my television class tape and my radio class spin the music. Because remember now, there's still Soul Train. The local Soul Train that came out of Chicago with Don Cornelius is still on the air. Hmm. But it's not with Don Cornelius. There's a new person doing the local Chicago Soul Train. And also you had Don Cornelius who started Soul Train. And Gary also were, was able to see it when it was local. Hmm. So what I used to do is I used to do like a Roosevelt Soul Train where my my uh, TV class filmed students that came in and danced. And I would ask for a nickel to come in and they'd just go crazy, you know, like the soul train line and all that. You know? <laughs> and then what I did is I would take the tape and the television, bring it down to the cafeteria, and I would charge a nickel for people to watch it. And that's how we raised money for the junior prom. That's awesome. Now, like I said, there was a group of people that didn't like that. <laughs> This is, I, I think I, he is coming in and <laughs> yeah and like o- almost automatically but brother it had nothing it did have something to do with me so i'm not trying to play myself down but what made it happen mr g is something that i know you know truth knows truth and loves no love mm. they knew that i was truthful and that i loved them and i received back from them what i was given to them Mm. It's a magic formula. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Truth knows truth. There, there's nothing special about me except I love my people unconditionally. Indeed. And I'm saying to myself, you know, like Roosevelt High School didn't have a movie house. Gary, Gary did not have a movie house. Gary did not have a banquet hall. When the when the Ebony Fashion Fair came, which is a very famous fashion show from Ebony Magazine, when it came to Gary, they had the fashion show in Roosevelt High School. In other places, they have it in banquet halls. That's amazing. And Gary had nothing, nothing. I had never been in a town like that before. No movie house, nothing special for the children, nothing special as an arcade, anything. I I would think they would add some stuff like Mike Jackson 5 is blowing up. and That's right. (laughs) didn't have now they have a lot of different things but mm. back in 1977 brother it was a steel town it it, it 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 had a toxic atmosphere in terms of the steel mills mm-hmm. and my my observation was like if i could get the students to go to a roller skating activity why not do that why not give them something because the roller skating rink was outside of Gary, Indiana. Oh, okay. So we had to rent a bus mm-hmm. to get to the roller rink. But I work, like I say, I work money in to get them hot dogs and pizza and whatever else they were selling for food at, at the thing. So they knew I was fighting for them. They knew that I wanted the best for them and they just enjoyed my company. In November, a brother came to me and uh, he said uh, that he wouldn't be in class the next day. And he showed me the um, why, why he couldn't be. Uh, excuse to be absent and it was he had to go to court Hmm. and it said accomplice to murder whoa and i said to the brother i said now mind you this brother came to every one of my classes brother was never absent this brother used to come sometime with a with a tie on wow he always did his homework he was always in the class before the class began Hmm. and i said to him brother I said, I would consider you my favorite student. How could this happen? Mm. He said, well, you know, things happen. (laughs) (laughs) And I said, well, let let me ask you this. I said, you are in class every day 
you are dressed appropriately. You are here before the class begins and you leave. Sometimes he would stay to ask me a question, but for the most part, he would then leave. I said, how are you doing in your other classes? He said, I have no idea. Your class is the only one I come to. Wow. I come in second period and I leave third. And then I asked him why. What is it about my class that would impact you that way? He said, because I honestly feel that you respect me. Hmm. That changed my life. Hmm. Because when he told me that, that's when I got my divine orders. He gave me my divine orders. Here I am. And by the way, brother, right after this happened, I uh, resigned from my radio and television job. Hmm. And the program manager made me write a letter of resignation. He said, because ain't nobody going to believe that you, that you, (laughs) because I was getting paid five times the salary in radio and television that I was getting to be a teacher. You know, like what, they probably looking at you like you were crazy. Like, what what, what are you thinking, right? (laughs) Brother, not like I was crazy. They were looking at me like I was crazy. (laughs) Not only that, but I got my first job. Hmm. At the time, I was thinking about moving over to um, um, uh, JPC, the radio station in Chicago, which was run by Ebony and Johnson Publishing. Mm. And they they were interested in me going to Chicago. So I would have been able to go to a major radio station. Um, And I would have my I had my first job. I was in. I didn't have to leave. Nobody forced me out. There was another jazz station that wanted me to come work, WWDJ, where it was a jazz radio station. And, you know, they liked the way I flowed. They wanted me to go there. I turned them all down. Wow. Tom Joyner was at um, was at JPC at this time. Hmm. Or he was a young disc jockey at this time. He was the main disc jockey there. But they were interested in me coming out to Chicago to do radio there. Man, you, you're making me want to go back in the in the archives and see if I can find some some uh, oh, yeah. like the common in, in in the radio, man. Oh man, you know, like I, you know, I put more dips in your hips, more cut in your strut, more glide in your stride. And if you can't <laughs> dig it, you got a hole in your soul, and you don't eat chicken on Sunday. <laughs> man, that's how I was the generation that brought rap music and hip hop into existence. Really. That's the generation that did it. Coming up out of Gil Scott Heron, the last poets. Okay, that's my generation. I Mm -hmm, was mm -hmm. radio at that time. And so I understand what was happening. In a school I worked was right down the block from where Cool Herc used to have his uh, house parties on Sedgwick Avenue. Because when I started teaching in the Bronx, the first year I started teaching in the Bronx, 1979, Mm -hmm. was when Rapper's Delight was on the first on the radio. Wow. So that ushered in rap music on radio, 1979. That was my first year teaching in New York. Because after I, because guess what? They told the, they told the guy that did radio and television because he took a year off Mm -hmm. (coughs) and they told him, they said, listen, I told you I made some toxic enemies while I was there. Right. And brother, some of them look like me and they look like you. To be expected. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) That's part of what you do. Yeah. And that's part of what we experience. And so they contacted him and they told him, they say, look, we can um, we can guarantee you that you'll have a job teaching here when you come back next year. But if you don't come back next term, we can't guarantee you that you're going to come back to your radio and television because this teacher that's up in here now, he's got such a hold on these students. You will not be able to teach this class again. So they conspired and he came back from sabbatical. And they removed me from the class. Hmm. And that's what made me return back to New York as a teacher. That is, I didn't even know they did sabbatical in um, at the high school level. Oh, yeah. But, you, but normally you take a year off. You don't take, you see, in the earlier grades, like you take a term off, mm-hmm. you know. Oh, no, no. My bad. In the earlier grades, you must take a year off. When you get to high school, you can take a term off or a year off. And he took a year off because he couldn't handle the students. <laughs> And here I come easing in. And you know what's interesting, which is unfortunate, is because after I left and I came back, I went to Washington, D.C. And I was looking for radio work in D.C. for a year, 1977, 
well, 1978, really. Mm-hmm. And um, I was looking for work in D.C. And then I decided to come back to New York right. when I started teaching in 79. But many of my students stayed in contact with me. And they told me that by February, all of the television equipment was broke. Wow. Um, they, they did not allow students to actually do the turntables in radio anymore. Hmm. And the program was nowhere near what it was. That's by February, March of 78. Hmm. They, they discontinued me in 1977. Now, mind you, brother, I could have stayed in Gary in radio and still be making five times what I made in education. And not only that, my production manager job was from four to about eight. And my weekend disc jockey job was only on Saturday and Sunday, six to six, both days. Hmm. So I could have stayed in Gary and continued. But when that brother told me that he honestly believed I respected him, brother, that, that turned my life around. And that's what it's all about, man. And here I thought I was going to bring music because I brought a lot of New York music to Gary, Indiana that nobody had ever heard before. Mm. And here I thought I was going to bring something to Gary and I didn't know that Gary was going to bring something to me. <laughs> the ancestors spoke. And, and spoke to that brother that was going to go to court the next day for accomplice to murder. Damn. And that's my next uh, thing I always tell people. Always listen to people because you never know when the ancestors and the creator are speaking to you through them. Hmm. You never know. Wise words. Some of, the, some, some of the most powerful lessons I learned in my life came from five-year-olds in my kindergarten class. I believe it. I believe it. Yo, Mr. G, I always tell people, you really want to know who you are? Do mm-hmm. you really want to know the kind of person you are? Hang around five-year-olds for a while. Not ones related to you. Just hang around five-year-olds that are not embarrassed to tell you the truth about yourself. And most of them are not. (laughs) They are not. (laughs) And that's something that I learned in my educational career. And that's what I brought back with me to New York. And I've taught uh, in the New York City public school system for 31 years, three months and 15 days. I taught college for 14 years. I've taught every subject. I've taught every grade. That is powerful, man. Um, and I know like when you first got into the, uh, you know, in, into teaching, it was the beginnings also of, um, you know, special education. Yeah. So when you, you know, when you started teaching, doing your thing, you know, in, in the Bronx, in the city, um, what were some things that were like that you were seeing in connection to kind of special education? Did you did you have a sense of like this thing might not be good for us, like in the beginnings or did it come like after a while? Well, I couldn't get over the fact that they said that certain children, special children, needed special education. Because my thing is all children need special education. Mm. And, you know, my thing was, as I was watching, this is when the Laura decree was out, the Lao decree. Mm-hmm. And it's when bilingual education became, became formalized along with the special ed public law right. uh, to teach in the least restrictive environment. Most of the schools I was in in the beginning of my career did not have special education classes. I watched them form. Mm. And I watched them form because most of the young brothers who had so much spunk and knucklehead, because they, yeah, you know, they, a little bit of that too. Yeah. <laughs> that's who they put in special ed. But there really were no children really deserving in the beginning of special ed. They were in other classes that had, it wasn't called special ed. It was for classes for the mentally retarded or whatever, or whatever they may have been. Right. But the formalization of, of, uh, of special ed in the, in the late seventies, uh, I just watched a lot of things. And my thing was, is that some of the most intelligent students, people I've ever met in my life were either in special ed or in Rikers Island. Hmm. I've met geniuses in state penitentiaries in, in Atwater, California right outside of Fresno, because I spent a lot of time visiting incarceration centers. And I've, I've had a chance to get up and close and talk to the brothers and sisters who are incarcerated. Mm-hmm. And I understand what's happening, but we cannot offer excuses. Right. There, ma'at is a law. It's a natural law that you must follow. Mm-hmm. Nature, life, you're born they give you a set of cards. 
Mr. G, you got your cards. Brother Kaba got his cards. Mm -hmm. I've known people who have been given very bad cards, a very bad hand, and they've done very well. And I've seen people given a very good hand and they blow it. Mm -hmm. So I've come to realize it's not the cards that you're given. It's how you play them. And I often tell that to children. Mm. Oh, 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 you know, okay, I, I understand. Daddy may not be home. People may be very abusive to you. You might be very sad. And I understand that. But when all is said and done, you're still going to have to answer to what it is. There was a brother I had in kindergarten. And uh, this is in the early part of my career. Mm -hmm. And it, this brother gave a lot of challenges, a lot of problems. And uh, we used to have to call his mother, you know, to put him in check. Mm -hmm. And when mother would come, see, the principal didn't want to deal with her because she was a heroin addict. Mm -hmm. And so she had me. I was, I was teaching at this time. But I was also acting as the administrative assistant there, which is not quite an assistant principal, but close to it. Right. And when I'd be at the table with mother and this young man, mom would go into a stoop. You know, she you know, she'd go into a nod. And at that point, just he and I, and I would talk to him. I look, I know your mother loves you very much. And I said, I know you see the problems. And I said, but you got to do better, man. You have to do better in the class. Mm hmm. And I would talk to him. And through the years, as I knew him, because he graduated fourth grade, in the years that I knew him, I used to talk to him. And he used to explain to me, yeah, man, I, okay, years later now, upwards mm -hmm. of 20 years later, I'm in a train station, lower Manhattan, and I hear somebody scream my name out, Mr. Cole. And I turn around, and here's this young brother that, I had when he was in kindergarten, first, second, third, and fourth grade. Right. And this brother came and he hugged me. Mm. And I thought he was going to break my back. <laughs> he, me so hard. he said, Mr. Coleman, he said, I just got out of prison six months ago. Wow. And he said, when I was in my prison cell, I would shout your name out. Mm. Because I, I remembered what you told me. And I realized, had I just listened and understood what you were saying, uh, things might have been different. His mother died, you know, uh, but he said, I'm going for a job. He said, now that I see you, I'm feeling good about it. I think I'm going to get it. He said, but I just want to let you know, if you ever felt a strong surge, it was because I was screaming your name out when I was in my prison cell. <laughs> because I remembered what you told me. And he said, and, and he said, the way you told it to me, he said, it wasn't until I got into prison that I understood it. So like, I felt like that was a Malcolm Elijah moment for him, mm. you know, not the same way, but my understanding and my love for him, uh, just the respect I had for him as a young man and the respect I had for his mother. Cause when she come up out the nod, we would pick up right where we left off in the car. I never disrespected her because boy. I saw a lot of heroin addicts in my neighborhood when I grew up. Mm -hmm. I remember a lot of the brothers that we used to hang out with. I remember when they no longer hung out with us playing basketball or hockey or, and they'd be off on the bench with the other people doing drugs. Mm -hmm. I remember. And I also remember Mr. G that, but by the grace of God, there go I, I could have very easily turned that way. Mm -hmm. As most of us who grew up in that, in that environment could. Right. Of course, my mother, my father, my sister stayed, made sure I was involved in the church. I was involved in choir, altar boy. So I was always very active. I didn't have busy, you know, I didn't have idle time. And it was just my disposition to want to do something with my life. Because I was looking, because remember, I used to turn my TV on and I would see those dogs biting black people down south. I was two years old when Emmett Till was murdered. I was a young man when those little girls were blown up in that church. I grew up during that period mm -hmm. as a child. I'm a child of that mentality. And I just said, I ain't going down like that. If mm -hmm. I'm going to go down, I'm going to go down because I'm standing up against you, not because I fell for you. And so that's what I bring to the community. That's what I bring to education. I bring an understanding of how we got here. I bring a love for us as a people unconditionally.
and a desire to do better. And I'm going to do whatever I can in the education. That's my lane. I'm in education. Okay. I ain't getting out my lane. <laughs> it's important. Because, you know, Dr. Ben Carson taught me very valuable. And, and bottom line is, brother, I, when, when I taught eighth grade summer school language arts, I used to teach his book, Gifted Hands. Hmm. I, I used to play Beethoven in class like he played Beethoven when he was doing his operation. I, I was so impressed by this brother and what he represented as a brain surgeon, a neurosurgeon. This brother was it. It was powerful. Hmm. And then he joined ex-president Donald Trump's administration. <laughs> and he became Man. in charge of HUD. And let me tell you something, brother. He taught me a very valuable lesson. Mm -hmm. When I tell you that I stay in my lane, I was always doing it, but he confirmed it. <laughs> and I came to realize that no matter how much of a genius you may be in one area, mm -hmm. you can become a complete idiot when you cross lanes into something else. I see. I see. Stay in your lane. <laughs> stay in your lane. <laughs> Because oh, he would have gone down in history as a phenomenal brain surgeon. Yep. Instead, he's going to go down as somebody that bought a $13,000 table for his house and then threw his wife under the bus hmm. to create an excuse as to why he did what he did. Yeah. When a man throws his wife under the bus, that tells me something about that man's manhood. Ooh. I would take the blame. Before I would let my wife take the blame. Even if she did it, I'd still take the blame. I would never throw my wife, my woman under the bus. Makes sense. You're supposed to protect, that, right? That's the bottom line. At all, family first, brother. Family first. You protect your family. Indeed. 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 Yeah. Um, speaking of the uh, the kids that you were talking about, like as we dive into special education, you know, in the literature, you know, it, we, we read about all the multiple intelligence and the different things of that sort um, and the EQ and the IQ, but a lot of that stuff is not even practiced when it comes to our children, right? So um, can you dive into kind of the different intelligences and how we as Black adults and Black educators should be tackling it as it relates to uh, Black children as far as the multiple intelligences and then um, the emotional intelligences? Well. I, I would recommend that you go to my Instagram page. I, I, I have a um I I, I have a, a um excerpt from a piece that my son and I did. We call it a quibinar, mm -hmm. a quick webinar, where I talk about Naila and the bee, and I make a comparison with Akila and the bee. And um what what is um what we're basically talking about is that there are multiple ways to be intelligent. We get the impression that you know, uh, if you do good in math and reading for the most part, then science, then you're intelligent. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is that there are other intelligences. And exactly. Dr. Howard Gardner came up with these ideas. He he's started with seven. He's got more. I have a problem with the others, but the seven that he started with, I can work with. But he's basically telling us that there are multiple ways that human beings interact. And Thomas Armstrong who is an educational psychologist, he then went and developed a applying multiple intelligences on the psychiatric level onto educational psychiatry. And so I've always applied multiple intelligences as to understanding how our children can learn. There's many different ways, avenues to learn. And basically you have the emotional intelligence and you have the academic intelligence. There, for me, with the seven, there, there, there are five academic intelligences. Mm -hmm. There's the music, which is guided by rhythm. Mm -hmm. There's the kinesthetic, which is movement. There is spatial, which is visual. There is language, which is communication. And there's logic, which is math, science, and reason. The emotional intelligences are the intrapersonal, which is self-reflective, right. and the interpersonal, which is social. And when you understand this, for instance, you know, we know children that like to tap on the desk mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we tell them, stop it. That's annoying. <laughs> but that's a rhythmic way of learning. That's rhythmic. Right. Akila and the bee used to tap her, her leg when she was spelled. That's rhythmic. You, you go on the rhythm and you can assimilate information. Mm. 
sports is all physics and science. You know, when, you know, you know, people say, man, I, I, I can't handle them ratio and percentages. And then I say, uh, tell me, what about Michael Jordan? Or what about, you know, one of the baseball players? You know, what's, you know, what's their percentage? And they'll rattle those things off. Oh, yeah. Stats galore. <laughs> yeah, stats. Oh, yep. they eat this, that, that. She do this, that, that. I say, well, that's statistics. Mm-hmm. Children always trouble boys that they're always throwing things, trying to throw things in the garbage can. So I say, okay, so y'all want to throw stuff? Okay, hold on. Let's let, 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 let okay, move the chair. And they would move the chairs, and I would take the garbage can and I would put it in the front of the class. And I would say, okay, everybody get online now. And they'd be looking at each other, and I say, okay, now we're gonna we're gonna throw that paper. You like to throw paper in the garbage? Okay, here. Now, now you can do it. I want you to throw the paper into the garbage. But here's what I want you to do. I'll give you a dime. I'll give you a penny for every time you can tell me how many times. Tell me how many times you're going to get the paper in the trash can. No, no, don't start yet. Tell me how many times. I'm going to do it 10 times. Okay. So they start and then they miss one. Okay. No, you're off. Does somebody else say, I'm going to do it five times. Okay. And they do it six. I say, okay, you're off. Because they have to do the exact what they said. Mm Because that's probability and statistics. Mm. And so here they are talking about how they don't understand something. And yet they're doing it every time they try to throw something in the garbage can. Exactly. Even the that's percentages the when they're giving you like, you know, Michael Jordan stats and his percentages, like that's the same yeah. thing. Yeah. And the baseball players, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, their stats, how many times it bat, you know, football, same exact thing. And then the children say, wow, yeah, <laughs> I do know that, you mm-hmm. know, and Ahine sing a song, Girl on Fire. She sound good, but she can't get fractions, but she couldn't have started that song without a fraction. Mm. Three, four times. Okay, quarter note, half note, eighth note, sixteenth note. Oh no, you know fractions. You just know it a different way. Multiple intelligences says, be comfortable in where you know it. That's not to say I can't transfer it into math class, right. but what it is saying is that I can't tell you that you don't know it. So what happens when we bring the math teacher with the gym teacher together? What happens when we bring the math teacher and the music teacher together? And start having them integrate their lessons so that when the math teacher is teaching, uh, the gym teacher is teaching rate time, time equals distance where every time you throw the basketball in the hoop. So that's what multiple intelligence is. It's it's attempting to develop a way in which you can present information that can be assimilated. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And And it's not just about... I was saying that makes so much sense. And it's in the the books, you know? It's just not... It's not for our kids. It's not. It's not implemented into the education. It's like you, they, you know, automatically just forget all about that, you know. <laughs> and then we just go directly to test taking and um, test prep and all this kind of stuff as a means of you know telling how intelligent uh, you know our kids are. It's fascinating. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. True. Absolutely. Yeah. Another. Um, yeah, man. I just wanted to share. Uh huh. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I no, no, I wanted to share with the community, you know, some of the things because I want them uh to, to know how to get in contact with me to be able to get uh you know go to my website. Mm-hmm. I have a free e-course study guide up www.kabakamene.com. Mm-hmm. K-A-B-K-A-M-E-N-E.com. And I just wanted to let them know that that's where a lot of my information is. Instagrams and quibinars and things that I'm doing. That's that's where they're located. Got it. Got it. Thank you for that. And also, the books that I have up on Amazon, you know, the life history of Professor William Leo Hansberry. Yes, just read that uh, one. Yep. Yeah. The original uh, architect for, for the African Studies program. Mm-hmm, my second mm-hmm. book is Spirituality Before Religions. And my third book is uh, Shabaka Stone, which is the pattern in the tabernacle that tells us the way in which the cosmos came into being is the way in which we came into being and we continue becoming. And once you get the pattern down, there's nothing that you cannot do that you cannot achieve in your life. Indeed. And um, and so, you know, this is where we are right now. Indeed. And one of the things I appreciate about your writing too is that it's very simple. And I think a lot of writers and authors in the intellectual sphere, as it comes to Black people, as it relates to Black people, mm-hmm. kind of forget where we're at. You know, <laughs> like, uh, you know a lot of, 
it doesn't change that much in the school that you can have like 70% of black kids in the school not reading at grade level and then they become adults and they're not like they don't become master readers or that some of them do but majority you know of black adults are not yeah. high level readers you know so and, you know that is how it happens and it starts when you're young mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know it just starts when you're young and this is what we have to do with our children to begin to develop a way that we can let them understand what it is that they have to do right and right. Um, um this is where we are brother this is where we are right i want to dive slightly into a little bit of the history before you know you leave us um but even before that um you know identify you kind of as a, a master uh teacher and uh i would say a master student as well because you can't be a master's teacher without being a master student so can you identify some like skills some of the things that you kind of done to get to where you're at to be able to um, speak, you know, things that happened years, you know, thousands of years ago, speak it into a story and speak it into like, almost like you're not even thinking about it. It's just flowing, you know, that, that takes a, a high level of skill and understanding. Um, so can you dive into the student component of that and then diving into the teaching component of that? Like some of the things that you did to get to that level. Holistic learning, brother, Hol holistic learning, holistic teaching seeing the interrelationship to everything, synthesis, Bloom's taxonomy, mm -hmm. you know, understanding Bloom's taxonomy from, from going from knowledge to comprehension, to application, to analysis, synthesis, and then evaluation. Those are the steps. Mm -hmm. You start off slow and you build the cadence as you go along. Right. Holistic learning, left and right hemisphere. They say that your left hemisphere is analogical. Your right hemisphere is uh, well, my bad. Left hemisphere is analytical and the right hemisphere is analogical. In other words, your mathematician and your scientist and your reasoner that reasons lives in the left side of your brain. The artist, the musician, the one that is creative lives in the right side of your brain. But in between your two hemispheres, you have a part of the brain known as the corpus callosum. And the corpus callosum is the bridge between the left and the right hemisphere. You always try to bring information. For instance, if I gave my students a math problem, their homework was to draw it, draw the math problem. So mm -hmm. I'm taking an analytical concept in math and I'm transferring it over into your artistic ability. Right. If you find that you're carrying everything with the right side, like you carry bags on your right, in your right hand, start carrying things in your left hand. We have to be able to balance our thinking and our living. And to do that, we should not be one dominant side. So whatever we're doing that we lean towards the right side, we should start practicing on the left side. It's, it's, it's the stereophonics of the brain. We think in stereo. We don't think on left or right. That makes sense. That and makes sometimes sense. when we find ourselves only in one area. Yes, sir. So I was saying that that makes a ton of sense. And I didn't really understand. Like, I didn't really you know when we. When we find ourselves focusing on one side, well, yeah, what I was saying is that when, when, when you find yourself sticking only one side of your brain, first you got to know the parts of your brain. Once you know the parts of your brain, then there are things that you can do. So it becomes important that as we develop ourselves that we understand the brain. We have to study the brain to understand teaching and learning. And yes. you are right. This is where we are, my brother. This yes. is where we are. This is what we're doing. So I just look forward to the future. And I look forward to um, super sheroes like <laughs> Cheetah Girl and others developing themselves into who they want to be. It is not an achievement gap. It's an opportunity gap. Mm. And the more opportunities we have, the better we will succeed. We have to expose our children to many different sports. Because my sport in college was gymnastics. Really? When I became, when I, my first year teaching was as a gym teacher in New York, I was a gym teacher and I got all sorts of different um, equipment in gymnastics and I taught them gymnastics. You know, the, the other gym teachers would just, when they came, they throw a basketball out. No, <laughs> when you come in, you form line and we do calisthenics. And then I had a horse. I had the parallel bars. And That's I taught them gymnastics. That is interesting. You know, that, is... that was my sport. I got them involved in the Police Athletic League mm -hmm. Olympics. 
And it culminated every year in a great Olympics down by Yankee Stadium, mm -hmm. McCombs Park, expose our children to more than just, you know, I, and they love basketball. I understand that. But there's other sports, mm -hmm. you know, that I'd like you to know, slap ball, racquetball, you know, there's a lot of things that you can be exposed to. But we don't expose our children to that. So they never know it exists. Exactly. The parent involvement program. Mm -hmm. And the parent told me this is the first time she was ever out of the Bronx in her life. Mm. See, to me, I couldn't understand that. Because I'm always going from one borough to another. I'm traveling various parts of the country. How anyone could stay and never leave the Bronx. Mm. But some people do. Mm -hmm, that's exposure mm -hmm. exposure yeah you're right man um i think that that you is know, super so. important it's part of the the education process is exposure oh, yeah. and um yeah. you know that that kid might find you know like their purpose through that you know <laughs> just just yeah. just exposing them to uh to different things um yeah i wanted to tackle a little bit of the history stuff because i think there's some questions i have that only i think you would be right to answer um so I was listening um, through, you know, YouTube and everything. And, um, you know, there was a gentleman that we all know. And he was saying um, that he was talking about the whole Christopher Columbus thing. Um, and, you know, people have this whole different ideologies about who he was and what he did. I mean, I think for us in the Black community, we should kind of know better at this point in time. You know, after, I, uh, you know, Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, the research that you've done, everything, like we should know better about who Christopher Columbus was, but um, he was, he was in a, um, in a, uh, uh, a podcast and he was saying that um, Christopher Columbus, um, him coming to America was like the most significant thing to have ever happened like to our human species. And he said that it kind of allowed like the human species to speciate, speciate. Uh, was what he 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 said like pretty much speciate excuse me speciate um and um it made you know Christopher Columbus was able to make contact with humans you know for the first time in thousands of years and it was a lot it allowed people to kind of enter you know speciate or whatever and um we owe him that you know that now that we have this common genetic you know group within each other we owe him that and you know he's one of the most important people historically because of that so he was talking about a lot of good within christopher columbus this is black guy by the way but uh, he was talking about a lot of good within christopher columbus and um and that whole concept so i kind of wanted to get your thoughts about that um you know because i know this is like your expertise and you know what you think about that comment well if we take it from the start. What I got from it, it's equivalent to saying that the devil has taken over the earth and it's the best thing that ever happened for the earth. Because when you think about post-1492, right. there it did make a great change in the world. There's no question. But was it good? That's the question. And do you really know where it came from? And you see, one of the things about being a scholar in the Western world is you have no touch of reality as to what happened. Because had folk understood, they would have understood that there were Africans in this part of the world long before Cristobal Colon. You would know that what brought Cristobal Colon to America was his exposure to African people. So it's not like, it's not the way he expressed it, but there were things that he said that were very important to be heard, particularly when he talked about the Ice Age mm -hmm. and about what happened during the Ice Age. Right. It's very important to understand some of the other fundamental principles, but to in any way, shape or form, believe that the first time the world was exposed to each other was 1492 is absolutely incorrect. And scientifically, it doesn't measure because of the nature of what happened, because it cannot be explained. And it was not explained. It was just said. Exactly. And so when I know that when you are steep, and also let me go back to just a, a quote by Carter G. Woodson, who is the father of what we today call African History Month, African-American History Month. Carter G. Woodson, one of the first 
black graduates of Harvard University, so to speak, said it took him 30 years to undo the damage that Harvard University had done to him. The damage that goes on in your mind when you go to their universities. See, the only reason why I ever went on to get my master's degree was so that I could get paid. <laughs> my first master's is what gave me my teacher's license because, right. you know, by law in New York, you have to um, you have to have a your first master's degree within five years of being appointed. Yes, yes. So yes. my first master's in history was for that. Mm hmm. My second master's was I became an assistant principal and executive assistant to the superintendent of my district. And I, and I needed a master's degree in educational administration and supervision to be able to support why I could be in that position. I was offered two PhDs free because I was a college professor. I turned them both down because I'm not interested in that. And also I was already teaching college. So why did I need a doctorate? Not to mention People refer to me as Dr. Kaba. I never call myself Dr. Kaba. I call myself Brother Kaba. But I got that title, Dr. Kaba, from Harlem and from the black neighborhoods that I've traveled to teach. Mm. When I'd be on the corner of 125th Street, you could go on YouTube and you, and you can find me talking right outside the Apollo Theater mm -hmm. on 125th Street, talking about culture. You can see me teaching class in the street. And so the community started calling me doctor. First, it was Dr. Booker T. And then when I corrected my name to Kaba, they call me Dr. Kaba. Mm -hmm. I tell people I got my doctorate from UCLA. They say, UCLA? You got your from? I say, yeah, UCLA, the university on the corner of Lenox Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I've ever wanted. And the same, same place Malcolm X got it, right? That, yeah. That's exactly right. We're, we're, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're both alumni of UCLA. <laughs> and you see, my thing, Mr. G, is that the highest form of flat of compliment to me is when the community calls you that. Mm. I don't care nothing about no accredited college. It has its place. I, I respect the rigor of a PhD program. And I respect the vigor of a student that has to get a PhD. I understand and respect that. But Harvard, like what you were about to say, has to be correct because you went to Harvard. Because some of the most ignorant people I've ever met have double degrees from Ivy League colleges. <laughs> so just because you went to Harvard or Yale does not make you intelligent to me. Mm -hmm. Some of the most academically gifted people I know are emotionally unstable. I agree. And I so agree. So that's how I approach it, mm -hmm. you know, and that's how I've approached teaching. That's how I've approached. Ex it's not that I disrespect. I don't disrespect you. But as Dr. Clark used to always say, I have never met a mind finer than mine. At the same time, I am not saying that my mind is finer than everybody else's. I just say never met a mind that's finer than mine. And I'll go head to head with anybody that I know because of what I've studied, right. not because of who I am, not because I'm black, mm -hmm. but because of my experience to get me where I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is, um, I, I kind of thought about kind of the same things that you were talking about when he was <laughs> mentioning that, um, you know, not not fully aware of, you know, I guess some of the work that you've done and Dr. Ivan Van Sertema in the, you know, tracing back, you know, Christopher Columbus and his voyages and the impacts and it just didn't make sense at all, but, um, you know, so well, first of all, on his fourth voyage, man, the Spanish came and arrested him, hmm. put him in, put him in the bay, in 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 the bottom part of the ship, in the hull of the ship, brought him back to Spain, tried him for treason, found him guilty, and put him in jail. And then it took to give up all the money and riches that he had in order to to, to bail his father out. And the Spaniards told him, look. You can have him. We'll take everything he got. You can have him, but he can't stay in Spain. So you better get him out of here. <laughs> so you know where Cristobal Colon is buried? In the Dominican Republic. That's where Cristobal Colon is buried because they didn't want him. He was a liar. He was a cheat. And the Spanish crown realized he was a double agent for the Portuguese. So on the fourth voyage, they sent ships out to arrest him, bring him back to Spain, try him for treason, found guilty. And they tossed him in jail. 
same same man. Cristobal Colon did did nothing but bring bad news to the melanated people of the world, mm -hmm. and he started something that happened before that. Every time they've been in power, they've always lost power because of they they just don't know how to lead. First was the Persians. Persians took over Kemet, mm -hmm. became a world power, 525 BC. Mm -hmm. Within 200 years, give or take, the Greeks came in 332 BC and beat the Persians. And then they took over the power of Kush Kemet. And then by 30 uh, uh, BC, the Romans came in, beat the Greeks, and they took it over. By 300 something uh, AD, the Romans were chased out, they failed. Europe went into the Dark Ages, did not come out until Africans went into Spain and brought with them civilization that brought forward the Renaissance, which brought forward the Western civilization. Mm -hmm. And they've been having this for a little over 500 years, and they still didn't get it right. Mm -hmm. They still didn't get it right, fam. And for as long as we follow them, you're walking off a precipice. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> but uh, but yeah. evidence, brother. Yes. Evidence. Uh -huh. Look at the look at the Persians. Look at the Greeks, look at the Romans, look at Western civilization. Now, here's what the other shoe said. The other shoe said is that the old kingdom of Kemet or Egypt, the first dynasty, the old kingdom, the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth dynasty mm -hmm. existed over 2,100 years, over 2,100 years from like 42, 25 you know, to about 21 something. I'm I may be a little bit off on my numbers, don't want to do it, but it was over 2,100 years, 2,300 something, but it was over 2,100 years that one family with groups of families from the first to the sixth ruled Africa and Europeans couldn't even do that combined. Wow. That's context right there. So don't follow them. They don't know what they're doing. Exactly. Well said, well said. So I was listening to a uh, um, you know, previous lecture you did and you recommended this book. The name is escaping me, but it's talking about um, what is to come in the future and looking at different inventions and different um, into the, it, it talks about from like 2030 into 2100. And the author, like they spoke to a lot of different scientists and inventors. So it's not based off of anything like, um, you know, it's based off actual things that are happening and occurring right now. So, you know, we're talking about like by the year 2100, like people being able to move things with their mind and all type of, you know, things and um, the advancement of technology. And we're looking at self-driving cars, we're looking at all type of different things that, that are occurring, you know? So I know you recommended that book. So within that, when we talk about the future, like where, where, where do black people fit into this future and how can we make sure that we are in this future? you know, um, and that we are thriving in this future and we're not just, you know, struggling to maintain, like, you know, and not being left behind, you know, because when we look at these advancements, they're happening so quickly and we're already behind. How do we keep from falling behind even more and catch up so we can be, you know, in the future, like doing, doing some of these things and a part of some of these things? The uh, book that we're referencing is called The Future of Physics. Yes, yes, yes. Currently reading, yes. By Dr. Michu Kaku, M-I-C-H-I-O-K-A-K-U. Solar power is the future wealth of the planet. Solar power. Mm. Cheetah girl, she definitely should be studying solar power. Yes. It's the, it's the future wealth of the planet. We're going to get up off fossil fuels. We're going to get up off of a lot of the ways in which we're getting energy. And energy is only as strong and vibrant as its energy source. We're on a very weak energy source because it's based on the earth. We're gonna continue with wind power and water power. Solar power is the future wealth of the planet. There will not be an air, A-I-R-E, that you can put at the end of your name to tell you how rich you are. There'll be no millionaire, no billionaire, no trillionaire. There'll be no concept because the sun will give you abundant energy. So there is no limit to your wealth. You won't be able to judge wealth like we do in dollars and cents. It's going to be different. Solar power is the future wealth of the planet. Mm -hmm. And I encourage us to Google it. There are books on online that you can get for free 
Solar Power Demystified, Renewable Energy. All of these books will help us move forward. Solar Power is the future wealth of the planet. You can see a lot of things going on. And you know what's interesting is that the places where the sun shines the brightest, the people are the most melanated. Mm. It's like the creator and ancestors put wealth in our backyard and said, here, take it and yep. go with it. Yep. And we have to study solar power. And I have lessons on in, in, uh, at, at my website on solar power. My books talk about solar power. I will be taking a look. Just finish um, Dr. Leo Hansberry. I'll be taking a okay. look at the next ones. Well, there's a chapter that I'm dealing with the Aten text where I'm dealing with the text themselves and I'm talking about what the text is actually saying through analysis. And they're glorifying the power of the sun. Our ancestors, the reason, one of the reasons why the pyramids was built was in order to be a nuclear reactor. Mm. And that the pyramids actually were able to take uh, the energy from the sun in and bring it down because, you know, the pyramids are almost as deep as they are tall. They go over 300 and something feet underground before they rise 481.4 feet above ground. There's a book called The Giza Power Plant mm -hmm. that if you're interested, we'll understand what the pyramids are. Yeah, the pyramids you. are laid out like a computer. Mm. I got that up on my Instagram page and, and I'm comparing a computer motherboard to the family. We just don't know how great we are. We mm -hmm. really don't. We really don't. You're right. But as long as we keep programs like this going on, my brother, we'll find out. And as long as we have young sisters like Maya on guard doing what they're doing and dads that look out, we'll do it. I appreciate it's a matter it. of time. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. No doubt. Um, as we yep. as we wrap up, um, Dr. Kamene, um, when we look back at you know some of the amazing work that you've done um, on the educational level, on the historical level, um, and people are reading you know the uh, the uh, autobiography of you, or people are looking at your documentary. What is it that you want people to remember about who you were and what you stood for? I, I want us to get a sense of unity and, and stop these superficial arguments and fightings. I want us to understand who we are as a people, but most importantly, I want us to own our footprints. And by that, I mean, whatever has happened in life, have no regrets. Because everything that's happened to me in my life, Mr. G, everything that's happened in my life mm -hmm. has led me to sit here and talk to you right now. Mm. Had I done anything different, this might not have happened. Own your footprints. Whatever you've done, have the strength of your conviction. Embrace it. No matter how good or not so good. That's you. That's what your life has brought. Forgive yourself for your transgressions and make sure you never do it again. But there's nothing you can do about the past. It's done. All you can do, see, wise people don't lose. They either win or they learn. Hmm. And what they learn is to help them win next time. Hmm. So you just keep on keeping on because it ain't over to win, you know? And again, please go to my website. Yes, www.kabakamane.com yes. Download my free e-course and study guide. Please go to Amazon and look at the books. Before you even look at the books, read the reviews. Let them direct you as to your interest. Let the reviews of other people and the impact that my work has had on them speak for itself. And you'll get a sense of where we're going and what we have to do. Spirituality is un seen science science has seen spirituality you i each and every one of us is the creator having a human experience mm. you don't have to look for god out here go into the mirror 
and a reflection of the person you're looking at is the greatest creator that you ever had. Powerful. And so you just keep on, keep on, fam. Go to my Instagram page. I always put up inspirational information, short clips of my work at Kaba Kamene. Because family, we just have to do this. No matter what, I don't, okay, much respect to anyone that wants reparations. Mm -hmm. I support that. Mm -hmm. They they owe you. (laughs) For what we've gone through, they owe you. But I ain't waiting. Mm. I, I am not waiting for them to give me anything. Because family, when all is said and done, even if they gave you everything that you wanted, it still depends on what you do that makes the difference. It's facts. always going to come back to what we do, not what people do for us. Malcolm X, Elijah Muhammad, Marcus Garvey, Booker T. Washington. They all told us the same thing. Don't wait for others to do for you what you should be doing for yourself. Mm. I've lived that all my life. I don't wait for nobody to do nothing. I appreciate the help I've received. And there have been many people who have helped me in so many different ways. There have been many people who have done great things for me that have helped me get where I am today. I appreciate them and I respect them and I love them for all they did. But the bottom line is, is if I wasn't actively involved in attempting to do this for myself, they would never have been successful in doing what they did for me. This should be our mantra. This last thing I'm going to say. Mm-hmm. This should be our mantra when we get up in the morning. You go in the mirror. Let me tell you what Dr. Clark, my first lesson from Dr. Clark, he told me, told us, five young ones, this, he said, this is your, your homework assignment. I want, I want you to look in the mirror and I want to, you to tell the person you're looking at, I love you and mean it. Because mm-hmm. if you can't do that, there is nothing anyone else can do for you. And I've oh. always remembered that. Created don't make mistakes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Girls say, oh, my nose is too big. I said, well, honey, can you breathe? Mm. She said, yeah. I said, well, your nose is just the right side. Okay. Look in the mirror and love your nose. Love the size of your lips. Love the complexion of your skin. Love the texture of your hair. And if by chance you think that there, there needs to be improvements, don't look in the mirror and say, I hate how I look. Say, I love how I look but I need to do some things so I can fall in love with me one more time. Mm. And brothers, we must respect our sisters. And sisters, you must respect the brothers. Brothers, you got to respect yourself. Sisters, you got to respect yourself. Because it is only when you respect yourself that someone else can understand what respecting you is and only then can you respect someone else. If you can't respect yourself, there is no way that you could respect somebody else. You, you might have another kind of feeling, but it ain't respect. Mm. When you respect yourself, you can respect others. When you love yourself, you can love others. Well said. We got to well. get this together. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And when you look in the mirror and say, I love right after that, I want to hear you say, if it is to be, it's up to me. Take control over your life. Own your footprints. Because if you blame somebody else for the position you find yourself in, you give them the power to take you out of that position, but you also give them the power to keep you in. If it is to be, it's up to me. Well said, well said. We usually ask for a final quote, but we might just leave it at that. If it is up to be, it's left to me, man. That is powerful. If it is to be, it's up to me. It's up to me. Don't wait for no one to do nothing for you that you can't do for yourself. Man. Appreciate other people's support and help, but depend only on yourself. You are born with a Judas and a Messiah. The Judas is born to make sure you don't reach your goals. The Messiah is born to make sure you do. Mm. The Judas may fall nine times, but the Messiah rises ten. Keep on keeping on. Yes, it sir. ain't over. We win. <laughs> <laughs> Man, um, Dr. Kamini, you just gave us like a, a wealth of uh, gems. Uh, thank you so much for taking out the time. Um, you know, I know, you know, you've done just so much that you could literally just kick up your feet and just chill, you know, the rest of life, man, but you're continuing to do the work. And um, that's one of the things I appreciate most about you is that, you know, 
like you said, it ain't over until we win and you, you just, you know, warrior for us, man. So I really appreciate just the work that you've done and the work that you continue doing. And um, the fact that you can come on on programs like this and come on on Hidden Colors and come on on, on different platforms and spread the same message. And I appreciate that, man. So thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate your appreciation, Mr. G. And I, I'm proud of you and I respect the work that you're doing. I just look forward to the future, brother. We're going to continue these types of conversations. We're going to move forward. Yes, sir. To be continued. Um, Absolutely. Appreciate, appreciate that so much. And regarding and, uh, your family, you're doing a wonderful job with your family, brother. Keep doing what you're doing. And um, we're just going to keep on keeping on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We stand on on the shoulders of giants, you know, so that is from it. the best. <laughs> that is it, brother, man. That is it. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, so, guys, thank you for listening. Um, I hope you had your notepads, your pens and you took notes. And man, the, the amount of information that we got in a short amount of time and we learned so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kamini, Con- uh, for giving us information about your life, man. Some of this stuff I was hearing for the first time. And um, okay. you know, I've been listening to you for a very long time. So, um, you know, it was nice to hear some things that I never heard before about, about your life. So thank you for being open with us and just sharing that information. Um, and it is such a powerful tool. Uh, so again, listeners, make sure you share the program. Uh, this will be continued. We will be back talking to uh, Dr. Kamene. Um, he has a wealth of information. So we wanna definitely dive into a little bit more of information that he has um, and he that he's always willing to share. So we appreciate that. Uh, so again, share the program and always remember your mind is the most powerful tool in the universe. Therefore, if you can think it, you can do it. If you believe in it, you can be it. And if you fight for it, you can have it. The world is yours. This has been your host, Mr. G, and I will see you next time on Mastermind. Uh, so every day I'm going hard. Talking business, bank accounts, and credit cards. And somehow we defeat the odds and making sure that no one starves illegal or you had a job.